it's the Comics Are Great show, uh, the visual story- storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.adl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, the lifestyle of a cartoonist, all of uh, the thoughts and things that go into this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today is another comics podcast host, and a cartoonist, or are you a cartoonist and a comics podcast host? We're going to find out today as we talk with Greg Shegel of StuffSaidShow.com. Hey, Greg. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's going good. You sound Hi. you sound fantastic, and I think this is one of the privileges of uh, actually having another fellow uh, broadcaster on, is you actually have like professional-grade equipment in front of you today. Is, is professional lowercase p? <laughs> You don't have a Heil PR48 in front of you and like a pop guard and No, I don't. I'm using a, a Sure SM48. Oh, 48. Not yeah. 58. Not 58. What is is there a preference there? Or did did you I mean we we'll be talking about your podcasting in a second here or later on in the show today. But uh do you find yourself kind of becoming like a nerd for audio equipment as you've done more of this stuff or no? I've I've lucked out in that I have a friend of mine Craig Chin who is a a music guy does uh, music production and that sort of thing. And I said, Craig, what do I get? Uh-huh. And, and he sort of laid it out. He's like, this is what you're going to need for spoken word. You're not really recording music. So you'll this, 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 and this. You know, he recommended a mic that didn't have an on-off switch so people wouldn't be prone to monkey with it. So it's phantom power. I'm not even sure what that means, but that's, <laughs> that's how they work. So I'm not quite the audio geek that I could be. Yeah. Uh, my brother's a musician, so I had the exact same uh, story where he came over and he saw me with my USB mic. He's like, well, this is okay, but you want to make it actually sound good? Like, here's the six things you need. And then he actually came over and, like, tweaked everything for me and, and like, put little stickers, don't move this, don't move that. So, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm, I'm mostly concerned, well, not mostly, but I'd say 30% concerned with the, the audio fidelity of the podcast. Mm. Because uh, there's, there's a lot of podcasts that just don't sound right. And that becomes frustrating. That brings up a question that I will dog ear for later on in the show. Because okay. first, I want to talk about your comics work. Because yes, you are a cartoonist, and let's see, gosh, what what what's your pedigree here? First of all, <laughs> you work on the SpongeBob comics for Nickelodeon. Yes, uh, I do. But you also wrote the X Babies series for Marvel. You were an assistant editor at Marvel, an editor at Marvel. I was never an editor. I was oh. an assistant for two and a half years. From okay. uh, late 97 to the start of 2000. Worked with Tom Brevoort. So, wow. Like like the, the, the tail end of the bullpen days. It was, it was the tail end of, I guess, what you'd call the, the Bob Harris era. The, the bankruptcy era. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was, on the more positive side, it was the beginning of the Heroes Return era of books. So, I was fortunate enough to work on the Avengers, Thor... Thunderbolts. We inherited the Hulk at a certain point. So we were working on uh, real live Marvel comics. So here's another thing that I think is an interesting way to phrase this is you got money to do comics work. That makes you one of, the, one of those rare, rare souls, right? I, 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 not only that, I, I, uh, I mean, granted, I was an intern, so that helped. But I, I got comics work by sending in submissions like a five page submission packet wow yeah. just just five you didn't do like the joe casada 15 page thing where you had to do like three five page stories i i submitted again part of this was i, I knew people from my internship but i submitted uh, five pages those were re- not rejected but i got comments and then i was given a plot to work from which i thought was a great achievement that an editor liked my work enough to say work on this plot tell me show me what you have And I worked on that. I did five pages of a Deadpool plot. And uh, that got me my first job doing a what-if comic for a different editor, believe it or not. (laughs) Well, well, okay. So we established this guy does real work, has been given money to do it. You also do um, uh, comics for different uh, companies, licensed properties. And what I wanted to focus on specifically today was your work on the SpongeBob comics. Not talking about the story as such, but more about talking about working on popular kids stories uh, based on like a, 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 a non-comic character, right? Like a, a cartoon sure. character or a toy or 
or whatever, because you, I think we talked about this. Well, we met for the first time uh, back in December when I was uh, out on a trip to New York, and we should say, actually, this is a little asterisk here, is this is part one of a three-part crossover that we're running. <laughs> it is. Uh, where... You're appearing on Comics Are Great later on in February. I'm, I appear on the Stuff Said Show, your podcast, and then it's going to around the same time. It should wrap up with a um, a crossover with the Kids Comics Revolution podcast with me and Dave Roman, and you sat down to talk about uh, superheroes for an hour and change. So yeah. yes, you're gonna get lots of Greg for the next couple of weeks, but that's a good thing because the guy's got a lot of really smart thoughts. But um, one of the things I think we talked about when when we were hanging out, or maybe I heard this on your show is uh, there's a weird dichotomy about working on something like a SpongeBob comic is that like if you're on the subway and somebody says, hey, you draw the SpongeBob comic? And they're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's awesome. You draw one of my favorite characters. But in the direct market comics industry, it's the reaction is a bit different. Yeah, there's in the direct market comics industry, if, you, if you're not working on the story that counts, as people like to say, is that, a, is that, a, is that That's an expression? Yeah, yeah, because if you're, let's say you're, you're doing the Marvel Adventures Spider-Man comic, great, you're drawing Spider-Man, but that's not the real Spider-Man. That story doesn't count. It's not part of canon. Oh. So if you're not working in canon, then, then what you're doing is a slightly lesser value in the, in the grand scheme of comic book continuity, let's say. Okay. If you're working on something that isn't a superhero, then that's maybe one rung down <laughs> below that. And if it's a licensed property that's not a superhero... You, you, you know, as as it, the expression we used, and I was talking to, well, I've talked to a bunch of people, but it's it's almost like a comics ghetto. <laughs> you know, how many people can you name that work on the Scooby Doo comic for DC, even though that's the highest numbered comic at DC right now? Well, that's the funny thing is like when you said that, I was like, I, I just it made me realize just how far afield I've grown from the direct market comics world in some respects because. When, when I found out that you worked on the Spongebob comics, I was like, that's like a dream job to me. Uh, working at Scooby-Doo, like when I found out Joe Statton was working on Scooby-Doo, I was like, wow, Joe Statton's doing Scooby-Doo, good for him. You know, I was so happy for him. Uh, working on a beloved children's property like that, it was like, that would be the best day job ever because uh, your, your work is being seen by so many people. Uh, whereas when I think about working in canonical or working in canon, I think, well, let's get into a lot of people, but not as much as, say, like, if you were doing the Powerpuff Girls comic. You know, when the Powerpuff Girls comic was publishing, I would walk by that. I'd see it at Toys R Us for crying out loud. It was everywhere. Uh, so for me, it's like, what? I, I, it's just, it's just I, I actually auditioned for a job uh, recently, and I didn't get it, but um, I was in the running. I was, like, in the top three of the American Idol competition for this gig to do a comic based on a popular line of girls' uh, dolls, action figures, whatever you want to call them. And I was like really excited about the gig. And I remember telling some friends about it and they were like, ah, you really want to do that? I'm like, like millions of girls would probably be reading this because it'd be like a, a, an insert with the toy kind of thing. That'd be amazing. But it's funny to me that, yeah, I, I wonder where that comes from, this dichotomy. I guess it comes out of the, the fact that we've been in the direct market for so many decades. Like that's I, been like the main place for superhero comics. I think there's that. I think there's also a bit of when you're doing a licensed property, you are drawing for the most part in the style of that property. So if you have a personal style, if you have an ex a, a way you draw something, that's gone. If if you're interested in becoming a superstar, in all like I mean, the job is to be invisible. The job, my job, is to draw SpongeBob so that it looks like it looks like on TV. Mm. And when you do that. You know, I have as many people say, so wait a minute, did you create SpongeBob? And you have to explain, no, I didn't. <laughs> I'm one of, you know, a couple of handfuls of people that learned to draw it accurately. And by extension, I'm, I benefit by having employment. But that's, you know, to, to be very cold and callous about it, that's what it is. It becomes a job where you're, you're there's, a, there's a, a slightly less, less of a personal connection to it only because you are translating something else through your hands and your eyes and that sort of thing. True. So that, that might be where it comes from on the creative side. On the reader side, I can't even begin to, <laughs> to theorize that. 
<laughs> yeah, because like like readers who would have that attitude that that what confuses me about this is how is this any different than somebody who's just doing their run on the Amazing Spider Man, you know? Because they didn't create Spider Man, uh, I guess because like they get to this is the David Michelinie Spider Man, this is the Todd McFarlane Spider Man, you know? This you get to put your mark on it, I guess, a little bit. Yeah, and 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 I guess one of the benefits of the SpongeBob comic is that there are a lot of independent cartoonists and stuff that get to work on it. And they, because of just the, the way the editorial is working on that book, can put their stamp on SpongeBob. So James Kachalka can do his version of SpongeBob. It just so happens that before there was a SpongeBob comic, I was doing SpongeBob licensed material. So I am trained to the point where I don't know if I could draw SpongeBob a different way. <laughs> like if you were to reinvent SpongeBob's look to tomorrow, like what would you do? I, I have no I, I Honestly, it's, it's so... I've been drawing SpongeBob since 2000. Wow. Yeah. So that's a long time, and there's a lot of... It's almost like breaking good habits. Like it would be very difficult for me to get the spot arrangement wrong or the number of curves around his body wrong. Sometimes I do, but it is a rare... <laughs> So, okay, because one of the questions I had lined up for you here was, uh, I remember talking years ago with Scott Neely, who worked on a lot of Scooby-Doo licensed stuff and uh, also Strawberry Shortcake stuff, which was another one of those things where when I found out he drew Strawberry Shortcake, uh, I remember hearing him on some other shows where like the host would be like chuckling, like, oh, you draw Strawberry Shortcake. Huh? And I'm listening going like, that would be amazing. I'd love to draw Strawberry Shortcake. And he, and he would say to me, uh, she's one of the toughest gigs in illustration because the client is so demanding that it has to be absolutely on model and if you're if the curve of her cheek is just one degree off they're gonna make you fix it and so he's like she's not for the meek you know uh and so i was wondering like i guess if you've been doing it 13 years now spongebob you probably don't get a whole lot of like oh could you make his eyes like two percent larger or anything like that it, it still happens i mean i just finished a story now where i was drawing spongebob jelly fishing so he wears his jelly fishing glasses and I was drawing them too square, so I had to round them out a little bit. Things like that sometimes. Because with a lot of that stuff, the models change ever so slightly over time. So if you look at SpongeBob from season one versus SpongeBob from the movie, mm -hmm. it's a dramatic difference, the shape of his body, all that stuff. So you, you kind of have to learn as you go along. But I, from the time I started drawing him, which was at Nickelodeon Licensing, to the point where I was able to draw a full pose and have it approved without changes was almost two years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, he's, there's, a, there's a lot of... The dynamics of SpongeBob are very odd in that, yeah, he's this square shape, but there's, there's proportions to it and his eyes relative to his mouth, relative to how they fit on his face. It's all... Now I do it, it's almost like second nature and I could, you know, churn SpongeBob sketches out at a convention. But it's... If you've ever seen somebody say, oh, yeah, I could draw a SpongeBob and then start drawing a SpongeBob, it never, it never looks right. I remember seeing, um, is it Bill Morrison, the guy Bongo? I saw him draw one at the Eisners one year, and I was just like, like that's wrong, that's wrong, the eyelashes are wrong, he's got the spots wrong, it's three freckles. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but that's, that's in my head because it's what I've been doing for. 13 years. Ooh. Uh, you know, but see, the, the, I guess, you know, this is the part that always confused me about, uh, you know, we, we going back a, a second for when we talk about, like, you don't get to leave your mark, quote unquote, but there's something that s speaks to the talent of a cartoonist who can inhabit the physics of a property, right? It's like, you got to get in there and you have to really understand the fundamentals of what makes, like, what, what makes the SpongeBob universe work and how the physics of all the different characters work. And I bet there's like a certain kind of slouch Squidward has that nobody else has. And when we see it, we know it, but you know, you got to decode it. You got to actually figure that, that science out. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, I spent a lot of time, I haven't done it much since, but I've certainly watched my fair share of SpongeBob and, you know, paused it and taken a screen cap and, converted that pose into a sketch that would be used on a t-shirt or something later on. And that was, that was essentially my job for two years. Uh, but while there, that's, that's all that invisible stuff. Yeah. That's, that's like somebody who can draw really strong figures. 
they don't always get the credit for drawing really strong figures if it doesn't look realistic or it doesn't have the right amount of cross hatching. It's all that invisible, what I call the underdrawing. Mm-hmm. That, you know, that's that's the craft of, of drawing, of illustration. And again, it's it's I guess I'm hitting on the point maybe it's the invisibility of it that I think gets a little frustrating as somebody who wants to create and be be known for being creative when you're working on an existing property that you did not create no matter how much you're bringing to it it's still seen as this monolith mm-hmm. you know unless you're you know, uh, Floyd Got- Gottrison is that a pronunciation who did those Mickey Mouse comics only now is getting some sort of attention for it <laughs> or Carl Barks right right like you really have to like do something remarkable well, then there's something to think about is maybe a couple generations from now, your work is going to be taught at the Center for Cartoon Studies, uh, right? I suppose I suppose anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I feel like the dynamics between uh, a modern a modern licensed property versus, say, a Carl Barks Uncle Scrooge, where he was creating stuff from whole cloth, it's, it's a different it's a different beast. I don't know enough about the mechanics of what he was doing and who is you know, who he had to answer to. Mm-hmm. But, you know, th- at this point, intellectual properties have uh, a a larger value outside of their comic war- universe. Mm-hmm. And you can only do so much. Sure, sure. But, okay, but let's, let's look at... As far at- as I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> but let's look at it another way. Um, sure. Because D- Dave Roman is in the chat, and he's uh, yeah, he's saying it's one thing to be able to draw a TV character on model. The combination of that skill with visual storytelling is what makes people like Greg rare and super valuable. Oh, so, sure. yeah, well, uh, I read your work; it's pretty good. Uh, but so you talk about like being known. There's being known and being known, right? I mean, within the industry, you're known for doing this SpongeBob thing, just because like the kids at school don't know about it, right? Uh, I. I don't know. Maybe, um, I, you know, it's it's not not to jump to the podcast. It's in doing the podcast. I've certainly gotten to know more people and and found out that they knew kind of who I was. But I know, you know, I've met people who recognize my name from when I was at Marvel and didn't know what I've been doing for the past ten years. Or there are people who, when I'd written that X Babies miniseries and I would was trying to promote that made no connection to the fact that, oh, that's the same name, maybe because they didn't do a simple Google search. <laughs> but it really is different parts of, of, of the industry. You know, in the same way that the stuff Dave does mm-hmm. is kind of on a radar of comics, but it's outside of the radar of comics, all caps. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's fine. I think that's actually helpful because it helps you understand who you're talking to. You know, I go to a comic store for free comic book day. The people that are responding to SpongeBob, it's a different group. I've told this story before where I was at uh, Emerald City Comic Con last year and to my right was Chris Giruso and to my left was Brandon Graham. And the, the, the crowds that would see each of them and the, and the, the interactions were, were dramatically different. I mean, on the one hot side, you had families and kids who were excited about G-Man and wanted to talk to him and, and tell them their favorite scenes. And on the other side were people who had read King City or were reading Prophet and just thought it was cool. And there was, there was a, lot, a lot harsher language to my left <laughs> than there was to my right. And it's just a different, it was a really stark, neither fan is better or worse, but it was a stark contrast into the availability of a fan base, the, the scope of who's out there reading comics. Well, yeah, yeah. So that, that, that leads me to a point that I had marked here for discussion with you is you talked about, and I think this was both something that we may have talked about off mic, but I, I think you talked about it on your show as well is, you know, you got your day job, you draw on SpongeBob. From my perspective, you're living the dream, but, you know, you got your own projects, you got your own things that you want to work on. Some of them are all ages where you could possibly you know, put some time into it and leverage your your name association with SpongeBob from the artist of SpongeBob SquarePants comics. Some of them aren't. Yeah. Uh, but the question is, is how do you choose which one to take on uh, and how do you find the time to do them? Because I'm sure doing your day job is pretty time-consuming. You're drawing comics all day. Now you got to draw comics all night too? 
there's there's the double edged sword of this gig, right? Uh, it is, but it's a different it's a different type of sword than what you're describing. It's less it's less day and night, and more. Once I've drawn a SpongeBob comic, like I just finished one yesterday, scanned it, sent it off, it's done. So technically today, where I have nothing on on the table, I should be working on aside from this conversation. Like <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> I should be working on something else. I should be laying a story out. I should be writing something. But there's a part of me that says, I just finished some work. I'm going to get paid for that. I'm good. And it's, it's less about the, the which do you start and more a case of getting that drive to do the thing when you already have a day job that pays the bills and satisfies the requirement of I'm a working cartoonist. Yeah. Which is really... You know, I, I, I talk to, in my building, I have a doorman, and every now and again, I'll say, how things go? And I'm like, you know what? I, I could complain, but that would make me a giant jerk because, <laughs> you know, I get to work from home. You know, it's freezing out yeah. right now, and I don't have to go anywhere. Right. I could stay home in, you know, in warm clothes and not have to leave. And for me to complain is, is a little uh, self-indulgent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the fact is, there are moments where I think, you know, going, you know, as, as much as I enjoy drawing comics, which is what I wanted to do since I was 11 years old, there's a part of me that's like, well, this isn't exactly, uh, you know, that's, that's, there's a point where that's silly. And there's a point where it goes, all right, then put up or shut up and start working on something. Yeah. Because I shouldn't be saying this out loud because the editor will hear it maybe, but I draw pretty quickly and I, and I can do this stuff sort of fast. Yeah. Uh, not Jack Kirby fast. But I'm I'm pretty fast, especially because I've been drawing it long enough. Right. Uh, that I could, I could stake out a little chunk of time here and there, uh, and I just I just waste that time. I'll I'll admit it, live for everyone to hear. <laughs> it, it shame yourself to maybe guilt yourself to spend some more time on personal projects. You know I've I've for for like the past year I've had it in my head that don't talk about your personal projects because the more you talk about them, the more in your mind they've they're done. So if you don't talk about them, it'll get you to do them. And now I'm thinking I might just have to start talking about them all the time so that I shame myself into doing them because, <laughs> I don't know, it's a, that's the double-edged sword. You think so? Because, yeah, I've heard, I've heard both sides of that. And I've, mm, I've, I've had some projects where I feel like once I've talked about it, like the, the juice is gone. But then that makes me wonder maybe there wasn't that much juice in it. Maybe it, 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 have you ever had this experience where you're like, oh, my gosh, that's a great idea for a story. And then you try or like like relaying a dream to somebody. Right. It's like, oh, I had this crazy dream where there was a ventriloquist dummy with pudding for eyes. And in the, in the context of the dream, it was terrifying. But you can't relay. You can't communicate that to somebody. And then it just falls flat. And you're like, oh. Uh, never mind. It was dumb. You know, uh, I sure. feel like that happens with story ideas sometimes. But then there's other ones where it's like, I can talk about this thing for four years while I'm working on it. And I'm not I'm not getting tired of it. And I, you know, I ship it. I think it's more a case of if you have a story that you've conceived and you've sort of even roughed it out in your mind and you can communicate that story. I can tell you what the beginning, middle and end are of that story as a storyteller. Job done. I've told the story. But the fact is, I haven't. I've told you the story. Yeah. And, and to tell the story in its truest form, you have to write it and draw it and lay it out and do. And that's like a time-consuming process. And it's so much easier for me to say, listen to this great story I did. Here's what happens. <laughs> right. Book one. Boom, 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 boom. And, and that becomes the case of, it's, it's, I love doing that, telling people what the ideas I have in my head. Uh, I need to put those ideas in, into a form you know, there's a children's book I wrote that I laid the whole thing out. It's done. It's written. I've shown it to people. I just haven't drawn it yet and inked it and colored it. And there was a point where I've shown it to enough people and gotten enough positive response. I'm like, great job, Greg. You did it. <laughs> no, I, haven't, I haven't done it. I did it for 12 people. <laughs> so, so that's one of the things that I, that I have on my to-do list that uh, I need to to-do. Did did working as an assistant editor for a few years at Marvel did that change the way you look at evaluating which projects to take on next? No, I think that that working as an assistant editor at Marvel made me. This was at a time to, to just sort of put things in context where it was very different than it is now. the The trade paperback bookshelf market was not what it is now. Um, you know, not everything was guaranteed to go to trade. 
numbers were down. You know, we, it was Marvel was as yet not out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So it was a period where you sort of look at the landscape and, and for me, it was a case of learning like, you know what, these guys who are doing it on their own, your, your Jeff Smith's and, and your Terry Moore's like they've, they're figuring something out and we could all stand to learn something from that, that model. Mm -hmm. So as much as I, I loved working there and I, and I really did love working there despite all the hardships of it, it actually informed me more of, you know, there, there are limitations to working in that. And, and it's, it's funny hearing me say it because I didn't do that much there. Like I was an assistant editor. I drew like five comics. And then, you know, 10 years later, I wrote this X-Babies miniseries. But there's a different dynamic doing that stuff than, than seeing and talking to people who do their own thing. I mean, you, for example, do your own thing. Mm. And whether, whether you're a major name or not, I, I look at you and go, that guy's got a contentment to him because there's a, there's a joy in that guy's heart that I want to, I want to glom onto and, and get into my own heart. <laughs> and, you mean, you mean in terms of being able to say, this is the thing that I want to invest my time in and commit to it kind of thing. Is that what you're talking about in terms of yeah, and, it, and, it's not, and it's mine. Yeah. I made it and I delivered it. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, we talked about on, on my show, finding your voice. Wow. And I, I look at and admire people who have found their voice and deliver on that voice. Even if it's in a very small, small scale, they're still doing it and sustaining themselves. And I don't know, I find, I find that impressive, if you'll take the compliment. I, I will, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, glad to, I'm glad that I come off as being contented. You do, uh, you, you know, <laughs> come on, I, I've never seen you not smiling. <laughs> I show up and I'm ready to laugh. I've been told that I'm a very easy audience that way. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're going to talk about stand-up comedy in a little bit, too, okay. and talk about easy audiences, because, yeah, you're, you're a bit of a, a stand-up comedy nerd. But, you know, I, I think that that's, that's, that's a fair summation of your work. As this, you've, we've described the perils and the joys of working in popular licensed character world, right? Uh, I, I and, and, and just to be fair, I appreciate that I get to do it. I want to make sure that yeah. this is... And, and, and also to a point that Dave made in his comment, a lot of the SpongeBob stories I do, and this might have something to do with it, are written by and oftentimes laid out by other cartoonists. So some of the storytelling is theirs, and my job is to put it on model. So it's a much more mechanical job. Oh, weird. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. So like, for example, um, um, instantly every name just <laughs> drop. Graham Annable will lay out a story, and then I will get those layouts and put them on model. Okay. Uh, so in cases like that, uh, and not to say I, I can't lay out a story and, and do that because I can, yeah. and people will see that in f the free comic book day issue coming out in May. I wrote and drew a two-page story that I'm very happy with. Uh, but to that end, I want to give credit to all those guys who are, write, who are cartoonists, who are writing and laying out stories, and then I am, I am just getting it past that finish line. If it's a relay race, I'm just the last guy to grab the baton. And even then, a colorist gets the baton after me. So yeah, yeah. Part of a, a part of a system of which I am uh, very pleased to be involved in. Sure. Well, you know, it's like I want I want to come around and close this this part of the discussion with this thought. Is like you talked earlier about like not feeling like you have the right to complain. Uh, yeah, I, I, I talk with a friend on the phone every week. We've been talking on the phone for 20 years, and all we talk about is comics, storytelling, and Transformers. And he started a conversation recently with, uh, hey, how are things going? And don't bore me with more of your belly aching about how awesome your life is. You know, it's like, you don't get to complain about this. Uh, you, you, you're hanging out with awesome cartoonists all the time. You're talking with awesome cartoonists. You're drawing the comics that you want to draw. Even if you are having a little trouble paying the bills, you don't get to complain about that, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that there is like when you've put in the years and you've achieved a certain level of expertise and you've got a certain level of, uh, you know, uh, sellable skills under your belt. I do think you get to say, yeah, and right. You earned sure. it. You earned it. You put in the time. Right. This isn't you just coming along and like, do, do, do. I'm on Twitter. Boy, I sure would like to draw SpongeBob someday. Ding. I got a job. Oh, no, my life sucks because I don't have this, too. You know, you, you ground your way through those years, right? So I do think that we get to point out the, the, the privileges and the pitfalls of, you know, and any line of work. Any line of work comes with baggage of some sort. 
So right, and after Kids Comic Revolution, we'll do a fourth show, the Complain Cast. <laughs> just throw it all out. There. <laughs> We're, we just air our grievances, yeah, and yeah. just cry publicly. Actually, yeah. that'll From be the, the most edges. popular thing we ever do. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> so speaking of podcasting, because you do a podcast and a I really, do. really great podcast called Stuff Said. Uh, yes. For those who don't live inside the uh, the direct market world or never stepped a foot in there, I'm, I'm guessing this refers to the uh, legendary phrase, Nuff Said. It, it is a it is an ever so sly reference to that, <laughs> and also a wonderfully vague title to just say it's a show where people say stuff. It's, it's um it took a while to get to that title, as I I was making lists of all kinds of all kinds of possible titles, and uh, and that one that one was the right title. But yeah, it is it is it is a sly reference to the old cover copy and next issue copy of Nuff Said. Right, where they and they would always follow some hyperbolic uh, expression of what's going to happen within this issue. This issue, Mysterio marries Aunt May and then gets a divorce and then she's pregnant. Nuff said, you know, that kind of thing, right? Or a very simple Doctor Doom. Nuff said. Nuff said, right, yeah. I, I will say I, was, I, was, I did get to write that in, when I was at Marvel, we'd write the letters pages and the next issue boxes. And I did get to, I think the one I wrote, if I remember, it was, it was Thor... Magog, Jurgens, John Amita Jr., Klaus Jansen, Nuff said. I think that was the. So was that like when you wrote that? Was there like a flourish on the end? Like, oh, I did it. <laughs> it was anytime I got to pull one of those moves, yeah, you know, a classic Marvel move. There's a bit of, a, you know, it's almost like you get to draw Spider Man. You get to do the 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 pastiche. It's it's fun. You get to feel like you're part of the machine. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because. At the time I was doing this, the the letters pages, you're still invisible. Like you didn't, it wasn't a first person thing. You had to write, "We here in the Avengers office, thank you for you know." Yeah. It was never me speaking, even though it kind of was me speaking. My name was never there. Yeah, I, I, it's I, a career of invisibility, Jersey. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, but. It, I think for many decades, comics was a career of invisibility. Regardless, like even when we go back to say like the the eighties. Dave Roman has been fond of pointing out to me that I was not a normal kid. He was not a normal kid. We were the kids who went to the comic store and dug through back issue boxes going, what haven't I found yet? Elementals, Kamiko, weird. I haven't heard of this. Let's read it, right? But not every kid does that. A lot of kids are just like, I like Spider-Man. I read Spider-Man. I'm done with Spider-Man. They're not looking at, oh, did, you know, who wrote this one? Sure. Um, so even for, like, like when I would tell people in my youth, like, ah, oh, you know, I, I love Blue Devil by Dan Mishkin and, and, uh, and, and Gary Cohn and Paris Cullens, uh, not, and none of the other kids were like, what? Who cares, right? It's like knowing who plays the voices on the cartoons. That you like, nobody pays attention to that stuff. So I think largely it's an invisible. Sure. You know, so, but still, I, I, I get your point. But uh, well, we were talking, but you're making me visible, and I appreciate it. So we're talking about podcasts. We'll get yes, back we're talking track. about podcast. Thank you for <laughs> see. Leave it to another podcast host to go. Wait, wait, we got to steer this boat. Um, so the interesting question to me about this is not to say, oh, another comics podcast. Why and justify why doing com podcasts about comics is interesting. What's interesting to me is I want to hear what benefits you have received from doing comics podcasting now let me back up i'm gonna i'm gonna preface this and frame this question up with this point you are a self-admitted stand-up comedy nerd yeah you love stand-up comedy uh you even do some comics on your website which is um hatterentertainment.com is that right hatterentertainment.com yeah. uh there's yeah. a comic section there and there's a stand-up comics comic on there i did do one comic where i, I told a joke <laughs> It was quite a challenge. It's it was it was a bit of an experiment. Can you do a comic? Can you do can you do comedy in a comic where comedy is so much about timing mm -hmm. and, and audio? And those are the two things that you kind of well comics you can control timing to a degree. But yeah, it was it was a in my mind, it would be something you could do as a whole comic, but I've not written that material. And uh, drawing a guy by a stool with a bottle of water can get tedious very quickly. <laughs> Well, you can do a three-quarter down shot. You can do a dramatic up shot, right? Um, but it's, that's all you're drawing over and over again. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But at the same time, you probably belt it out pretty fast because you're not doing like a whole lot of 
you know, three uh, th- three point perspective cityscapes. But yes. where I'm going with this, is, by the way, yeah. I thought you handled the timing issue really well in that Thank comic. You. That's what took the longest was breaking down the beats. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, I think I've heard you talk in some of your other shows before, like the the weird symmetries between stand up comedy and comic storytelling. Mm-hmm. But but where I want to go specifically with this is. Cartoonists as performers. This is a drum I've beaten on a lot on the Comics Are Great show, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But I think there's an interesting parallel here with here you are, you're doing a comics podcast, and I'm asking you about what benefits you've derived from this. And I'm wondering like, what similarities you may or may not have noticed, uh, if any, between being a performer as a cartoonist versus being the invisible guy in the background. Uh, it's a good question. I... I have a very particular approach to the performer aspect of what we do. Uh, I, I don't think I'm particularly great at it in that the, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of weird issues with the sell yourself, not your work paradigm that seems to exist now. Yeah. Uh, I, my Twitter account, which took me over a year to get to because I was so resistant to it, is not my name. It is stuff, it's the podcast, and I don't tweet personal stuff on there even on the podcast i'm more often than not i will cut out myself telling a story about myself uh, because it's not relevant to the conversation i'm having with the person i'm talking to if it just becomes me doing a flight of fancy telling some story it's like this this is self-serving and weird so so uh I'm, i'm i'm sitting at a chair i'm eating some chips i'm done with the chips that kind of thing yeah, like that's that that is. I mean, I'll I'll tell you that stuff, but that's really who's <laughs> who's interested, really. Uh, I mean, people might be, but I can't imagine. So, so there's there's an aspect of the performer that I'm not entirely comfortable with. Mm. That said, when I do the the podcast, there's a certain amount of. I'm less interested in a performance and more interested in an actual conversation. Uh, uh, uh. uh so, what am I, I guess it's a case of I try and be the real version of me that I would be in public. So when I go to a convention or I, I'm out in the world, I present myself in a certain way. It's not so much a performance as it is an edited version. Hmm. I'm not going to curse up a storm. The public you, the, 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 the you that goes grocery shopping. Well, no, that's a different me. That, that, <laughs> that me has got his iPad on. He's not talking to anybody. I'm talking about the, the public, per, the, the me that shows up at Free Comic Book Day is, is a, a particular version. Yeah. You know, in the same way that the me that hangs out with my friends might be slightly, although it's really no different than the way I hang out with my family. Uh, but, but it's, yeah, I guess it's less of a performance than it is an attempt to just have an actual conversation and present it for other people. Although there's a plenty of editing. I cut out a lot of ums and uhs. And but there's there, definitely a, there's a presentation more than a performance. I wonder for, I, it, well, it does, but I wonder if we're getting hung up on semantics here because I, I, I might be. Um, I, I'm, I've been guilty of this before because like when I think of performance, I also think of when you're talking with somebody. Because, like, okay, I, one, of the things, one of the cases I want to build here is why more cartoonists should consider getting into this audio stuff. Um, well, I can but, tell you that to, to answer your other question of what, what have been the benefits of yeah. doing it, uh, one of the reasons I started doing it, well, two main reasons I started, which wasn't your question, but it's going to help get to the answer. There's two major reasons. One is, and this was before I had heard your shows, there were no shows that I was listening to that were the kind of show I wanted to hear. Uh, right. It was a lot of, and I, I don't mean this in, the, in a disparaging way, but a lot of fan service, a lot of fans talking about comics. Mm-hmm. And I had been listening to, there were two shows where the, the, the guys hosting it were doing really nice work in terms of their interviews. One was, it used to be called The Sound of Young America, now it's called Bullseye. The host is Jesse Thorne, who does great interviews. He's really researched and informed about what he's talking about. And he asks questions that you could tell the interview subject appreciates being asked. It's not the same old questions they're being asked. And the other was uh, WTF which is Mark Maron's podcast. Mark Maron's, yeah. Stand-up comedy show, yeah. And that's a comedy show, and he would talk to comedians about why they do what they do, and it was a much more real conversation between peers. 
Mm. And I wasn't hearing any show like that. And I thought, you know what? After a while, and it, was, it took a good while, something just, you know, a, a flip switched in my brain. I'm like, you know what? I can figure this out. I know enough people where I can, I can put this show together the way I want that show to be. And then the other side of that coin was, going back to what we were saying before, I wanted to make something. I wanted to make something that was mine. And after drawing comics and not wanting to draw after I'd finished drawing a comic, I'm like, I got to do something. So doing this show, while it is tedious and takes more hours than it should, when I'm done, or like the episode with you that I'm currently editing, I'm down to like the last 15 minutes, there's a, there's a real, you get like a bit of a high when I'm coming to the end and I'm like, this thing's coming out good. Everything sounds right. All I got to do is add music. And then I spend way too long thinking about what songs to use. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a creative exercise and it's fun to be creative and make a thing. Yeah. Um, and that actually is almost transcending, you know, as much as I want more listeners and I want to get big names, editing the conversation with you or, or uh, the one I just had with Brad Geiger were, were they're much realer conversations than somebody who's maybe trying to promote something. Yeah. And I like that. I like having those, con- you know, I like having this conversation right here, whether it was oh, yeah. Yeah. recorded like, or not. I, I get, uh, I get um, emails from people who find out that I have a show and they say, oh, I've got a book that I want to promote. Can I be on your show? Talk about the book. I'm like, well, yes, but if you're going to show up, you better be prepared to have a roundtable discussion first. We'll talk about the book. I'm happy to promote your book, but I don't want to just do a, so tell me about the thought process of writing your book, like the Today Show kind of interview where it's like, what was going through your mind when you were writing that book, you yeah. know? Uh, yes, I, I, I totally, which, yeah, go ahead. Which is funny because it almost counters what I just said before. Like, I'm catching myself. I'm doing my own gotcha journalism <laughs> where, you know, I, I have so much, I have such weird issues with personality over product, yet I'm doing a show about personality. Well, uh, yeah, I wanted to loop back on that too. We're kind of going a field of where I wa- originally intended to go, but that's the cool thing about having a I discussion will not, show. I will not let you go where you want to go. <laughs> No, this is yeah. You know, I, I I also teach as part of my day my day living kind of stuff. And one of the things I'm really delighted by is when the student hacks the course. When the student sends me off on a tangent that I had no idea I was going to be there today because now I'm just not going through rote stuff. I'm actually you know being uh, immediate and present in the moment. That's the fun of doing this thing. But um, going back to your original hesitation about like whether or not you should have a personal Twitter account where you can say I'm eating chips. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I wonder how much of this comes out of your background where you're talking about you're writing the letters come, you're you're representing the machine. And so there are certain things that you are trained to think this is appropriate, this is inappropriate. You, you can compartmentalize those things where, you know, I'm, I had a fight with my girlfriend, whatever. Uh, that probably shouldn't go in the Avengers letter column this week, right? Unless I can find a way to rope it in as a really good joke to relate to something else in the book. Right. Um, I wonder how much of that is informing this this point of view because like you're right the the zeitgeist right now is just be as authentic and uninhibited and unedited as you want to be because that's what people glom onto. Uh, I I heard from uh, many other people that uh, when I first started doing audio shows when our audio levels were crappier and when we were less had less of a format and were more freeform, that was the most engaging because it was like eavesdropping on two guys just hanging out rather than we're putting on a show for you, right? We're putting on a persona. Yeah. Uh, I think it, 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 any of my uh, compartmentalization comes way before <laughs> I was a professional person. You know, it's it's either maybe it's that I'm a middle child, maybe it's just the way I was raised to, you know, there's private stuff and there's public stuff. Yeah. And there's just, there are things you talk about to strangers and there are things you don't. You don't ask any, you don't ask somebody how much they make. Mm-hmm. Like you don't ask somebody what they pay, what their rent, you know, like you don't ask those questions. Who'd That's, you vote for, Greg? That I'll, <laughs> that I'll tell you if you really want to know. No, we don't need to bring that onto the show. I'm just, I'm yeah, just trying to be funny. That spins off into a whole other thing. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You're not supposed to talk about politics, right? Right. Politics and religion. Unless you're on Facebook, and then you can yell at other people about why they voted the wrong way. Uh, of course. Uh, but but uh, I'd say that it comes more from just my own personal approaches to everything. It's not just, you know, I if I'm not comfortable with somebody, there's only so much I'm willing to share. Sure. That's a person, you know. So 
for me, but it's what a about, case what of... What about stand-up comedy? What about stand Because that's all, like, taking life experiences and distilling them down to the funny moments and sharing, like, often very painful things with people. It, it, depending on, on the comedian and their voice, sure. Um, but there are, there are plenty of comedians that are able to take their personal narrative and, and turn it into something, you know, changing details here and there. You know, they're not, they're not being... Uh, you know, Oprah's not going to bring them out on the couch and say, you lied about this. This isn't <laughs> accurate. You know, th- there's a certain right. amount of liberty in terms yeah. of being a comedian. You know, Bill Cosby would do jokes about his brother and his family and all that, but you, know, you, you can only imagine it wasn't a direct translation. It was filtered through the comedy mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my fellow cartoonist friends and I uh, talk about what we refer to as sad diner comics, <laughs> which are, you know... Uh, Oftentimes, an indie black and white comic of a guy in a diner or a laundromat pining over the girl he's afraid to talk to, or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a thing that everybody understands. We've all we've all been there. Yeah. But there's a certain point where you go, okay, now what else? Like, where's the writing part? Where's the um? And I realize this sounds like I'm completely insulting all of that stuff. But there's a point where you go, where's the twist? What is making this? more than just a diary. Yes, and yes. Yeah, you, you, the, the interesting thing I think I'm hearing here is the difference between... Because like a diary comic person would argue, I would imagine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play devil's advocate yeah, yeah. on their behalf, is, um, well, I'm selecting the moments that I'm showing you. I'm writing because I'm selecting the... I, I'm filtering through my Bill Cosby comedy mind, and these are the moments that I think that are worth looking at. Um, sure. you're just not seeing that craft because I'm not making it, you know, I'm not, I'm not pointing it out to you or I'm not screaming. That. It's a taste thing possibly. Um, but this comes back, argument. but, but this comes back to that, the, the duality or the, the, the duality we're drawing here between how sculpted is your public appearance and how immediate and unfiltered is your public appearance. And man, oh man, for people who grew up in an era before the internet, I, I can say this is something I struggle with all the time, all the time. I'm always wondering, like, is that the thing? Like, I'm feeling really giddy right now, and I want to share a thing. Here's a, here's a picture of my cat with a pair of glasses. I find out later that that's, like, a meme that millions of people have done, and I just committed an internet blasphemy because I did what a million other people did, you know? Um, but at the time, it was just, it struck me as funny. I didn't know that it was a thing, so I shared it, and now I'm I'm a jerk. So now I'm being more hesitant. Well, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to say the dumb thing that makes people go boo. Uh, you know, well, you want you want to be an original, an original thinker. Yeah, <laughs> well, sure, <laughs> most people do, but um, <laughs> but but then but then like the the advocates of the let it all hang out crowd would say, but no, but that's you just being who you are, and by letting us see that, like okay, let's go back to this. Like I, I'm coming to New York in December. And uh, Dave Roman says to me, hey, you should meet this guy I know. His name is Greg. He does a show. Um, it'd be really cool to do a crossover with him. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. Oh, he does a show like Stuff Said. All right, I'll, I'll download a whole mess of them. And so then for the next two weeks, I listened to like all the archives. By the way, episode 18, where you did it all by yourself, awesome episode. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, where you talked about your experience with uh, John Buscema. Everybody the should best. start there. Start there, and then go back to Chris Giarusso in for the first episode, which is a really lovely episode. Uh, also, Sam was the best. Jacob Shabbat, uh, his story of his uh, interpretation of a kid's description of Ghostbusters when he was a little kid. Fantastic. I won't spoil it. You got to hear it. <laughs> it's the best. But anyway, um, so I'm listening to this, and then by the time I come to New York, I felt like I know this guy. You know, I, I can immediately jump into a conversation with the guy because I know what his taste, what his viewpoint, what his background is. So there's like there's an argument to be made for by making yourself more available. You become uh, I was that much more invested in the SpongeBob comics I already had was like, wow, that's that's Greg's stuff, man. You know, it's not just, right. you know, the, the invisibility was stripped away and suddenly you are a real person to me. So which, which I'd say is, is maybe one of the things I'm, I'm learning is that you can be a, a public persona even if it's for 200 people, uh, and still maintain a, a sense of a private persona. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's, there's, again, it's, it's a presentation and it's a, I guess, a bit of performance. But there's, they're always straddling that line. I'm never, I'm never going to be fully, you know, when I go to conventions, I wear, I wear a button-down shirt. I do not wear button-down shirts in my day-to-day. I'm wearing one now because <laughs> I knew this would be a public appearance. Right. Uh, but in my day to day, I'm wearing a T-shirt. You know, I, I, it's it's 
So I, I but there's, there's, uh, I, I don't even know what I'm saying right now, but <laughs> I appreciate what you're saying because part of the thing I wanted to do with the show, and I think I say this in one of the early episodes, was I'm not going to talk about me a lot. I'm going to let you learn about me in the way I talk to people. Mm -hmm. And I think that has happened more than me doing a long 20 minute opening of here's what I'm working on and here's what's going on. And here's what's in my head. Well, it's going back to Mark Mara, that's exactly how he starts off every show yes. is he starts off with, I had a fight with my girlfriend. My cat got out of the house and I'm stressed out about that cat. And then here's an ad for sex toys. And then we're going to get into the, the actual interview of the show. Yeah. And I just don't think that I have the, the presentation ability that he has. And I don't think I have, I don't have the time or energy to make my life that compelling a narrative. <laughs> Well, what makes what makes his, his his narrative compelling is he's characterizing it with the whole "I'm stressed out about everything," right? Right. And and I'm telling you about my stress, which is funny. And again, and I think that's that's a matter of the filter. It's filtering. Whereas somebody else, if they were writing in their journal, or their diary, it would literally just be a list of complaints without any self reflection or observation or thing that makes it go. And here's why this is a funny tragedy kind of a thing. Right. Uh, and and that takes work. That takes time unless you are trained and skilled at presenting this information, which he has been doing for so many years. True. But here's but. where I'm going to counter argue you is I, I would argue that you've been doing this for years, too. You've been doing this whenever you're putting ideas down on a page and decide and selecting what is the, the thing that's worth showing. What is the right way to droop Squidward's mouth to, to really deliver his sense of disgust and shock, right? And That's how Chris Duffy, he's my editor. <laughs> well, but you're drawing it, right? I mean, yes. my argument is is that cartoonists are already storytellers if you're putting panels in a sequence and trying to deliver a narrative. So, those that skill set is there. It may not be as developed in a verbal sense, but I would argue this, when you're doing stuff said, as as as, a, as somebody who's done this before, I can hear you listening to what they're saying and isolating what are the cogent points that I'm going to use as a follow-up question. Oh, I was originally going to go here, now I'm going to go there. I'm just going to go there. Sometimes you announce it. Sometimes you telegraph your punches. But other times, it's just, it's invisible. And so you're both, A, you're managing your public persona, what's pr appropriate and inappropriate for me to say on this thing. Uh, B, you're listening to your guest while they're telling you something and anticipating where is the next logical place to go with that in a way that is respectful of them, doesn't get off off topic, or if it does go off topic, goes off topic in an interesting way. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, coming up with a response to that that's more than, yeah, cool, right? So you, you, you're, you're doing a lot of things simultaneously, and that is a performance. It's a live performance, that is that comes from storytelling skills, right? Yes, no. This show sounds awesome. It is awesome. I have to listen to it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess I I don't think of it as much that way because a lot of that happens in the editing. A lot of uh -huh. that happens in, you know, there are times where I say, "Oh, that's awesome," and then I will cut that out because it sounds, it sounds dumb. It sounds like a foolish response. So that that gets nixed, and then it moves into the next question. It's like a little pause. Uh, that's yeah. Uh, As you do in comics. Yeah. You know, there's definitely, there's editing and there's storytelling and all of that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to argue with you. You make, <laughs> you make very good points. So, okay. So, well, we, we got to get, um, is Sharon in the studio? I saw her earlier. Yeah, all right. So, we got to get to book recommendations. We're already at, can you believe it, Greg? We're at 55 minutes or so. I can believe it. Oh, my gosh. We didn't get through half of, I had so many other questions for you, like, which is your favorite SpongeBob character to draw and why? We'll save it for another time. I want to talk about Dumbo with you. We'll save it for another time. Plankton, Plankton is the easiest to draw. He's my favorite. <laughs> See, some of these I can answer fast. Dumbo See, I was hoping for, like, a philosophical thing, like, oh, the, 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 the curvature of Squidward's head is just, it's so, you know, it comes from art school. and I never went to art school. I went to art school for a month. It doesn't count. Uh, but we will do a roundtable with Dave in the future talking about stand-up comedy. I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about what we can learn from stand-up comics because I know you guys will. All I'll have to do is just throw three questions out, and I can sit back and let you guys do the work. 
So, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, at the end, we'll talk more about stuff said, but for now I have to introduce to everybody. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. Sharon I Iverson. It has been a long time. Hasn't it's it? been, yeah. Cause you weren't at the comics forum last month. So I know it feels like a long time since I've seen yeah. Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor district library. Yeah. Comics.aadl.org. We're going to talk about book recommendations, Greg. So I, I believe you have some too, but we'll start, okay. we'll start with Sharon. Sure. I, um, I'm a little late on some of these um, recommendations today. I know you talked about this with Dave Roman on your Kids, the Kids Comics, Comics Revolution. Revolution. Yeah. Um, Legend of Zeta. I had read Zeta the Space Girl, which I also have. I stole off the shelf, and the poor thing is really getting read. That's a good sign. It is a good sign. You yeah. always want to see that books have been messed with. Um, but at any rate, Zeta is a character that is just... I don't know. I can't help but wanting to read more about her. She's such a positive person in such a not great situation and makes the most of it. Um, Legend of Zeta, she's been stuck in space because she, uh, in her curiosity, pushed a little button the, on a device that from a meteor that sent her friend, Joseph, through a portal, and she followed through and uh, dealt with a situation of helping Joseph in Zeta the Space Girl, but now um, she's trying to figure out how can she get back to Earth. And uh, in the process, she's become a celebrity. Mm. And uh, that fame has good good sides and not so good sides. And when a robot appears that is almost like you know her double, she's like, hey, you know, stand in for me, and I can you know, go play a little bit. Um, but it ends up that Robot would rather be Zeta. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so it's the story of um, the the Robot version of Zeta taking on a mission that's a little bit tougher than, uh, oh, than it's the Robot or Zeta has any idea of. And how Zeta um, is left behind, uh, basically pushed away by the Robot Girl when they take off for that mission. And how... Is this going to come out in the mm. end? Will Zeta be able to connect with them? And you know, now Zeta the Space Girl by Van Hatke also has a fabulous cast. I oh. mean, she steals the show. She's the title character. Uh, but her, yeah. what makes it sing to me is the wild background cast. I mean, I and I think I said on the Kids Comics Revolution show, it felt like a lost Jim Henson story. It mm -hmm. felt like it's like the Muppets, where mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, it's about Kermit, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be as good without Fozzie, Rolf. Dr. Teeth and so on, right? Um, and how he can take, like I just, I bookmarked one page um, here, you know, what you would usually think as we get closer to, you know, Valentine's Day, a sweet little heart, <laughs> well, not exactly, and, and his heart attack, you know, <laughs> is just fantastic, and and her characters, like one, is just this circle mm -hmm. with two eyes. And you've talked about it in your comics classes, how much life he brings to, and, and, you know, character he brings into that one little blobby thing. You believe in one, right? I oh, mean, yeah. I, like in, he has They're a showdown real. in the first book, mm -hmm. which is just gut wrenching. Mm -hmm. And he's just an orb with eyes, right? Yeah. 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 The expression. And, and the character development that he does is really fun. So, of course, we're looking forward to another Zeta adventure. And then um, over the weekend. Oh, did you get this in I the got mail? This. I was a Kickstarter supporter for Jake's um, Antler Boy and other stories. Jake Parker. Yeah. Missile and, Mouse. Oh, well, there's just, you know, he's got so many stories that, this is a collection of stories that he has done over the years for flight or other things. And many of them really don't have um, a beginning or development like um, his Lucy Nova that's mm -hmm. in here is you, you kind of want to know, you know, that, that was that began as like a short comic that he ran in like the back of one of Kazu Kibuishi's comics. Uh, right. Like uh, it was in Daisy Cutter or something, I think. Yep, Daisy Cutter. Yeah, definitely. The Last Train. There's two stories of Lucy Nova. This is Hugo Earhart. And um, definitely you just jump in and Hugo is this this boy whose grandfather doesn't know that he's like an errand runner with a flying pig and a whale. Um 
taking messages up into another world up high above and dealing as a hero, basically, and making deliveries of those. And, you know, it's sort of like, well, how the heck did he get, you know, his job? And, you know, so I hope he'll come back and, and deal with those. Um, I love this one. This is the the robot and sparrow and in the back of the book he talks about that he was trying to do a robot love story with two robot characters and that just wasn't working and how bringing a sparrow in um, made all the difference but as much as I love the story it's the wonderful um, tones that he does I think this is one of my favorites here where yeah it's 10 degrees outside today and <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> Oh, to sit, you know, in the shade, you know, as the sun dapples through the leaves. Oh. Well, and look at how he kind of emphasizes that. And this is where I get to be like a nerdy comics professor, right? Is like with like by making it all white and just showing the only part that gets colored is the dappling. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. it really draws. You. He's he's a master storyteller. Jake yeah. Parker is. Uh, yeah. and, and plus, he's a great character designer. All of his characters yeah. are just so appealing, no matter what they are, whether it's a robot, whether it's a space adventure, whether it's. Yeah, it's like a this one. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is called Checkers. It's about a little girl who can't get anybody in their family's attention to play checkers. She even yells out at friends. No, nobody wants to play checkers. And finally, she wanders through a park with her box of checkers and finally sees this um, rabbit sitting on the bench. And it's like, you know, I don't suppose you'd like to play checkers. And then voila, the rabbit's like, you can see me. And she's like, you can see me in her face. The yeah. way it lights up is just wonderful. Yeah, and that that's actually on sale at his website, uh, mrjakeparker.com or agent44.bigcartel.com is where you can find it, The Antler Boy and Other Stories. Yeah, so those, cool. are, the, those are the two I brought today. That book came out so good. Yeah, yeah. You, wow. you want to borrow it? Mm, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I, I supported it, but I, I uh, yeah. elected to not get a reward just because I, I wanted more of the money to go towards making well, the book see, as good as it could be. There you go. Uh, so you can, now I can right. I can just borrow. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, because I'll probably be seeing you in a couple weeks, we have a Comic Artist Forum coming up on the 3rd of February mm -hmm. from 1 to 3 p.m. here at the downtown library. And I've been emailing back and forth with our guest presenter, Chad Sell. Mm -hmm. He's going to talk about how you can... Um, Really start working on promoting your comics. I know you guys were talking about Twitter and stuff. I know. We your were just talking about this. Media, yeah, yeah. Comics conventions and setting up websites and things like that. So, I so think if, if anybody listening to this was listening to me and Greg talk about the subject going like, oh, this is a lot to navigate. Come to the Comics Artist Forum. Chad yep. Sell will help straighten you all out. Yeah. Fly into Ann Arbor if you're. Actually, they should. Downtown. They should. We have an awesome <laughs> library here. Yep. So that's that's February third, one to three p.m. Right. downtown, fourth floor, fourth floor. Yeah. So yes, okay. Well, I'm gonna do my quick. I got one book recommendation, and then I will pass it off to Greg. Um, we were talking about Dave Roman all day today, and uh, I wanted to bring everybody's attention to the fact that Astronaut Academy is serializing as a webcomic right now. Astronaut Academy book two is at astronautacademy.com. It's updating daily, Monday through Friday, and Dave's been blogging like crazy on there, too, about all the influences that went into behind the scenes of the book. So um, I've said before many times the great thing about Dave's work, especially this book, is he writes like he's a fellow kid telling other kids a story. And that's not to say that it's like a little kid telling you, and then he did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. Well, it's still crafted. It's a master storytelling uh, or master storyteller at work, but it's with the voice and the enthusiasm of a child instead of the affected gather around children and I will regale you with a story, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more of the kid sitting along, it, he's sitting along next to the kids going like, isn't this awesome? Right, so, mm -hmm. uh, and the one of the latest updates features, uh, he introduces a heart-eating character. You know, like the characters in Astronaut Academy have many oh, yeah. hearts yes. and their heart containers. A heart-eating character has shown up and then things just got heavy. Oh. in astronautacademy.com. So people should check it out. book comes out in a couple months, and uh, it serialized online in the lead-up to that. Your only chance to read it for free. So Awesome. So, yes, Greg, are you still there? I'm still here, yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any book recommendations to throw out at the end of this? I feel like I have too many, but I'll, I'll, I'll blast through them. Uh, there's a book I read last year. It's an older book, but it's called Far Arden by Kevin Cannon. Mm. Uh, I was able to get it digitally for five bucks. It's over 400 pages. Wow. It's great. It's it's not it's not a kids comic, but it's a comic and it's it's like about Canadian 
uh, pirates. It's it's really good. Mm. It's a high seas adventure. Far it's Arden. Excellent. And then he's been serializing the sequel to it along with Xander Cannon doing his own graphic novel in Double Barrel, which is a digital first comic from Top Shelf. That stuff is excellent. And each one of those issues is over 80 pages and there's tutorials in the back and all kinds of great stuff in there. Uh, the cool. Sixth Gun by yeah. Cullen Bunn yes. and Brian Hurt is excellent. It's a supernatural western. Um, I'm going to promote three of my friends' books. Please the Intrepid Scapegoat, G-Man, and The Mighty Skullboy Army. Mighty and then it's... Go ahead. And then it's not a comic at all, but Jules Pfeiffer wrote a book years ago called The Man in the Ceiling about a kid who wants to be a cartoonist. Mm. And it is awesome. Uh, Jules Pfeiffer is awesome. And that book is tremendous. Wow. Uh, Mighty Skullboy Army has been promoted mm -hmm. on the show in the past. And I think we're getting it for the library's collection, if I'm not I mistaken. So. Um, also, G-Man is one of those books where the moment I read it, I said... Why have I not read this before? How could, how could, I, I met Chris for the first time, Chris Giorosso, the, the creator of G-Man, at ALA this past summer. And Dave Roman, as usual, introduces me to everybody. Uh, and so I meet him, and I'm flipping through the book. And the thing that struck me was his uh, word density on his pages. Like yeah. he, he really packs the dialogue in there, which... Growing up in the period I did, where that was normal to, for like to take fifteen to twenty minutes to read a comic book, I'm looking at this and I'm just refreshed. I'm like, "Oh, that's right. This is how it used to feel." And so I, I went up to Chris and I said, "Like, oh my god, I love your word balloon density." And he, and he said, "I think that's the first time anybody's ever said that to me." <laughs> like, well, that's that's what happens when other creators read your work, right? He's he's got a new book coming out this year, and I've read it, and it's awesome. He's he's really good. He also does a comic with Brad Geiger, uh, if he I'm does. not mistaken, which you talked about on the Stuff Said show where you talked with Brad Geiger. Great episode. Wonderful, candid uh, stories about Brad Geiger doing um, stand-up comedy. Yeah. Love that story. As somebody who recently did some public speaking where 30 people before I got on stage said, are you nervous? You know, with that <laughs> smile. And like that 30th person, I'm like... Yeah, I am now. Thanks. I felt like I had this thing under my thumb before, but thank you, everybody, for making me feel like garbage about this thing. Uh, it was it was gr great to hear that I'm not the only one who ever dealt with that. So I just spoiled that's, a little bit of the discussion, but that's the advantage of being a cartoonist is you you create the thing and then send it off and never have to see <laughs> anybody's reaction, unless you make the mistake of reading the comments on your website and then oh now I'm sad. <laughs> uh, but okay, so we're we're at the tail end of this one. So this is what I'm gonna say. Normally, I I put out a little call to say, hey everybody, give us a, like a thumbs up on the YouTube video or give us a review on iTunes, a star review. Forget that. Forget about comics are great this week. I want you to go to stuffsaidshow.com. I want you to subscribe through okay. iTunes, and then after, well, even before you listen, give it a star review. My my recommendation, my word says it's a five star show. But you can listen to a few episodes. Start with episode 18, then go back to episode one. You're gonna fall in love with this show, and uh, you may wind up replacing my show. I can live with that. Don't uh, do that. <laughs> <laughs> but do, but do check it out and and subscribe to it. I, I I absolutely. It's one of those shows where it's like this is what I was waiting for. You know, when I was when I first discovered podcasts in 2004, like this is what I was hoping I would hear. Um, so. Uh, Thanks, pe Jersey. People should give you a thumbs up on the iTunes, give you a star review. Uh, it's it's anonymous. You don't even have to write anything. Just go, oh, That's I think true. it deserves this many. But if you want to write a few words, you know, we, we, we eat that stuff like poi, guys. Just like when yeah, you I'll get. Take them. Yeah, when you get. Think about it. Cartoonists are watching. You're on Twitter. Somebody says, hey, I love the thing that you did on Tumblr the other day. And you you know how good that makes you feel? It makes us feel like 10 times better than that when you give us a, a review on iTunes. So well, It certainly makes you feel less invisible. Yeah. And that, that's a theme today, is invisibility. Make us less invisible. Make make Greg less invisible, for God's sakes. He deserves it. He's worked See, real hard on this. Now thing. I just want to like curl up into a corner and hide. <laughs> Too much attention. <laughs> oh, you'll get used to it. <laughs> uh, but yes, that, also check out, you know, uh, February 15th is when the episode, I think, is due with, with me yep. on it. If you really want to hear a long interview with me. Uh, but Greg asks really good probing questions, I think. Yeah, after you're done smooching with your loved one, Listen to <laughs> Jersey and I blather on. So thank you, Greg, uh, for thank being you. part of this. That this was super fun. Uh, thanks everybody who hung out in the ch in the chat client. Uh, thanks to Dave Roman of Yatime.com for hanging out and uh, offering some insights on this. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Sure. Good seeing you again. Good seeing you. So I'll see you again in a couple weeks mm -hmm. at the forum. And thank you to Matt Dubay, Tom Smith, and Eric Kloster in the production room for helping mm -hmm. put this show together. 
Uh, I, I've said it before, but I it, it bears repeating. Uh, Matt busts his back to make this show happen, and I appreciate all of his efforts on that. So the show will be collected at comicsarecreate.com slash CAG71. Uh, that's where you can find it, download it, and subscribe to it. Uh, until next time. Oh, any place else that people should follow you, Greg? Um, I guess on Twitter, it's Stuff Said Show. Stuff Said Show. That's pretty much it. And then we'll convince him to get a personal Twitter account because I want to know what he's eating every day. <laughs> and then I'll we send can, you an email. And then, we, you know. <laughs> and then we can convince Sharon to get sure, on Twitter too. Sure, yeah, that's never yeah, going to happen. Yeah. All right, but I'm Jersey on Twitter if you want to listen to about my potato chip stories. And uh, you can find more about uh, everything I do at comicsgreat.com. Until then, thanks for downloading, listening, and watching. Okay, bye. <laughs> Are we clear? Can we stop cursing now? <laughs> <laughs> I, we're still streaming. I think the, the um, end music is playing over top of us right now. But uh, in a second, we're going to kill the stream. And then you can say all the terrible things that you want to say, Greg. <laughs> all the